Okay, so those are the, the, the properties of images and containers that are relevant for when you're containerizing anything. I keep talking about a worked example. So let's do that now. Let's go through that. I'm going to go through some Docker images that are available online. And again, I use the same QR generator, so hopefully it's not dodgy, and hopefully it goes to the right place. But they're all up on GitHub, and they're also up on Docker Hub as well. So you, you're able to pull them in and use them yourself if you find them useful. Or you can look at them and go, I see what you're trying to do here. I need something different. And you can do your own thing. OK? So the first image for me is an operating system. I choose Ubuntu. Um, I know it well enough that I know, my, I know how my code will behave on it. I know what surprises, if any, it will have in store for me. Um, so I want a quiet life, so for me, Ubuntu gives me that in a way no other Linux distribution does. But in this layer is your operating system of choice. You have to have something. Unless you're using a language like Go, which does static binaries that don't have to load in any, any dynamic libraries whatsoever, anything else needs some sort of operating system to pull in the libraries it needs. Um, if there's any tools or any, any libraries, etc., you know you're going to use in any subsequent images, put them in here one place to maintain it all. You don't want to be editing four different Docker files at a higher layer every time you want to change something. Anything that's common, put them in here. In my experience, I do log into my containers. I do put a shell on my containers, a command line on there. So I put things like an editor and some other tools that I use, some other command line tools. I put them, I bake them into the base image so they're there for all the time. Last thing I want to be doing is trying to install software on a running container just to try and see what's going on. Because chances are it will fail. Um, especially if you run Ubuntu, they change their package list so regularly that um, even after just a couple of weeks, you'll find your containers just can't download and, run, uh, and install new packages. You have to go back to basics and rebuild them. Um, which is something you don't notice on a virtual machine or on a real computer. And the final thing I do is these volume mount points I've mentioned for persistent data and logs and the like. I standardize those in my base layer so that everything I build has to follow the same conventions. And my thinking here is I want to get it right first time. If I'm correcting something late in a subsequent layer, that's a maintenance overhead. It's something, and it's also something I'll forget about and trip over. And the chances are, when you forget about something and it bites you on the backside, it's because it's in the middle of an emergency. So it's just easier to smooth things out from uh, the base layer. Now, my, my base image doesn't know what I'm going to run inside it. It's not meant to run as a standalone thing. It's meant to be there for me to build on. So it needs something that will run pools of workers um, or processors like PHP, FPM, or Nginx, et cetera, down the road. Your virtual machines, and those of you who run Linux, your Unix systems, process number one is either init.d, traditionally, or systemd these days. But they expect to have full control over a real computer or hardware and everything. You probably can run them in a container, um, but I dread to think what sort of hoops you've got to jump through to make that work, and what hoops you've got to jump through to keep that working as they release new versions. So I use supervisor, supervisor d instead. Any of you heard of it? A few people? Oh, that's good to know. That's uh, it's good to see this doing the rounds. I like this because it doesn't care that it's not process number one. It just wants to be, it just wants to run its pools of workers and that's it. But another neat feature about this, I don't know if you guys know about this. You can, te you can put, tell it to load all the config files in its subfolder. And for containerizing applications, that's perfect because the image that installs PHP FPM, for example, or Nginx, just has to drop a file in that folder. I don't have to edit this main config file ever. And if you've got two images editing the same file, sooner or later you're going to run into problems. You're going to, one's going to make a mistake, or you're going to find you're, you're contradicting yourself too much. So you can just drop something in. So just something simple like that, just to run Nginx. It's really handy. And I mentioned this bootstrap script as well. So here's mine, and all it does, it, it follows the same principle. It looks in two folders for scripts and runs them. That's its job, is to just, uh, just to run these scripts. The reason it looks in two places 
is it looks for scripts that are baked into the image, and then it looks for any scripts I've sideloaded in my dev environment so that I can develop them and test them um, locally first before baking them in without worrying about that. So that's what it does. And then it runs supervisor afterwards. That's all it does. And you mentioned about how you can run commands inside your Docker file. You put those statements in. One of those statements tells Docker what to run when the container starts. And, and for my containers, it runs a script. And if you look at my Docker files, you'll see it um, for my Ubuntu server image, you'll see it doing that. So this is all up on GitHub for you to have a look at. And I mentioned standardizing the mount, mount points where I'm going to inside load and inject these persistent data volumes. I have four. Um, you don't have to have four. You can have as many or few as whatever suits you. Um, data and logs hopefully speak for themselves. Config is just for injecting stuff. For example, for when I'm running my SQL, I might want to um, inject some config to turn on slow query logging, for example. So I can do it that way. And then workspace is like your slash vagrant mount point when you run uh, virtual machines under vagrant. It's mapped from your host operating system from where your vagrant file is. Same idea. Um, I just call it workspace because we're on a project using vagrant and I've a I don't know, I can't remember if Vagrant offers both mount points or whether we changed the config. It's so long ago now, I can't remember. But that's one stuck with me because it's kind of technology neutral. And that's where my app goes. And what I do is at this layer, my it that's mapped to my real app on disk on my laptop. And then when I come to bake my app in, I copy it into slash workspace inside the image. And I'll show you that in a moment. So that's my base layer. It's just setting things up. It, it's not very useful on its own. Um, if you ran it, it would probably just exit straight away, or supervisor would say it's got nothing to do or something. Not even bother trying it, to be honest. But the next layer is my web server. And I've actually got two images here. I've got one for Nginx and a different one for Apache. I personally use Nginx, but large communities out there prefer Apache, and I've got a lot of historical documentation for Apache. So it's handy to have both hanging around. Um, but this could be Caddy. Uh, I think Light HTTPD is still around, if memory serves. Um, it doesn't matter. Just your web server of choice and the config files to support it. That's all it needs in this layer. Very simple, very light. You're all familiar with virtual hosting, I'm assuming, with web servers. The idea, the incoming host header is used to work out which config file is processed for that request and ultimately which app it goes to on the box. So you can put many different websites in the same box. Okay. Personally, I don't use that in containers. I want all the traffic, if it reaches that container, I want it all to go to whatever app is deployed in that container. For me, if I was going to put two, site, two different virtual sites inside a container, that should be two different containers. Personally, that's how I do it. I would run two containers. It's personal preference. You can, one thing about this technology is you can actually do whatever you want. But I, that works well for me. So I use that as a code smell personally. And this is my default Nginx config, uh, my default host. So, sorry? My <laughs> I cut that out to fit on the slide. So you see here, I've got. I don't know if you guys at the back can see this, how clear it is. Um, but I've got, these, I've got these, um, these tokens here, and those are expanded by my config, sorry, my bootstrap script when they run. I look at some environment variables, and I use those to rewrite those sections. For what I do, I find there's three things that I change. Where the, where the, where the root is of the, of the website, um, that might be like a slash public folder for, uh, you know, Zen based application, or if it's WordPress, it's going to be WordPress as root. So that needs to be configurable. Um, then the site, it, then that particular app itself may have some tailoring that's needed for Nginx, like WordPress for uh, permalinks and that sort of thing. And then what's needed to run the application. So for me, you know, that's loading PHP FPM with my Nginx stuff. So I've broken it up in these things, and I find that works really well for me personally. And I, I installed two bootstrap scrap scripts 
that my main image startup looks for. One to take the environment variables and use it to rewrite that file you've just seen. And then the second one goes through and just changes the permissions on the logs folder for Nginx to make sure it can write to that. Because if you're running in a dev environment, um, you may have accidentally or deliberately changed the file permissions and ownership of everything to be you. But when your container runs and your app wants to write to those folders, it needs to be owned by the user your the Nginx is running as, otherwise it can't write, and then you run into problems, like your app's not there and you're going, well, why is my connection refused? Because there's no logs, because it can't write. And little things like that can trip new developers up a lot, and people can lose many hours over things like that. So this is another example of where these little customization scripts can be really handy, because you can solve a problem before anyone ever runs into it and knows they have it. Really handy. Um, You'll notice there's no PHP in there, and that's deliberate at this state. Um, I might want to use this to set up a static site for somebody, or I might want to set up a site that's built um, using an app built in Python, or in Ruby, or anything else. So at this stage, I want this nice and generic. So that's why there's no lag runtime language of any kind baked into this image. So this would be my Ubuntu Nginx image in, uh, in my Docker files, my, sorry, my Docker images project on uh, GitHub. So now we're moving up the stack, and we need a runtime for our app. For us as PHP developers, that's going to be mod PHP or PHP FPM, typically. Um, as things like React come along, slowly but surely we're starting to move to PHP, accepting direct connections. Um, but most people are typically running things be still behind Nginx and Apache. So that's what we're talking about here. And it's the same gig what you need at this layer, and then you're supporting config files. It's really, really simple. There's not much to it. But I want to talk, I want to use this to do that deep dive into co-location. Now we're adding PHP into the images that we're baking. And this is a statement that I feel very passionately about. I am well aware that there are other voices on the internet and if memory serves, when I looked at the images Docker themselves maintain, they have different advice. Um, but I'm well aware that those other voices are saying Nginx in one container, PHP in a different container. What happens if you do that? Does anybody know if you split them up? You have to get the network stack involved. Absolutely right. We'll look at Apache and mod PHP first because it's the simple one. And we're going to go back to basics and use real iron for this. So here's, you know, here's a physical server, Apache and mod PHP. But the one thing, mod PHP is a dynamic library that is loaded into Apache when you run Apache. Um, you can actually, I think you can still compile it into Apache. Yeah, it's so long since I've done that, I don't know if you can still do it, but I imagine you can. So that's one process. And to the best of my knowledge, you can't split a single process across two containers. I'm pretty certain you can't do that. So you haven't got any choice. If you want to run Apache in mod PHP, it has to go in one container. There's, there's, there's not really a debate there that I'm aware of. But if we've got Apache or Nginx and we're using PHP FPM instead, are you all familiar with PHP FPM, sorry? I'm not, but I'm okay. Be so okay. So with PHP FPM is a separate daemon that, um, for running PHP. It runs as a daemon, and it, it runs its own pool of workers, and it, it, it takes incoming connections, and it, it um, then sends that traffic down to each of its workers to run the PHP script and sends the results back to whatever's called it. It's designed to be called from Apache or Nginx. It's not designed to accept connections directly from the outside world. It has none of the security or anything else that's required for that. That's the basic idea. So it's a separate process, and it's not a child process of Apache or Nginx either. You start the two of them separately. They're unrelated processes. They just cooperate together to serve your website. So as I was saying, they're separate processes, and they're not, they're not parent-child processes. And yeah, this is the reason I'm making a big deal about this, is because all the early advice says one process, one container. You split your containers up at the process level. Um, please don't. Really, please don't. And I'll show you why. Back to our physical server. 
Here's Apache, could be Nginx, it doesn't matter. Here's our PHP FPM process. Do you know how they talk to each other? Sockets. Sockets, what kind of socket? So not all sockets are equal. How many kinds of socket? Unix domain socket. There you go. That's just the standard inter-process communication, IPC method for two unrelated processes to talk each, to each other. Use a Unix domain socket. It is fast, it is mature, it is heavily optimized. It's gonna give you the fastest performance of a general purpose IPC mechanism. In theory, you could go faster with shared memory, I, I guess, but then of course you're into a whole board of pain with shared memory. So sockets, Unix domain sockets is the standard way it's all done. And if you run that in one container, we can still use our Unix domain socket. We can use the exact same approach inside the same container. And that socket is pretty much the same performance as on the physical server. You're not going to notice a difference, if there is a difference at all. It's perfect for that. So we don't have any overhead at all from containerizing our application if we're using that Unix domain socket. But what happens if we split it up? What happens if we do that? Now, how are they going to talk to each other? HTTP. Sorry? HTTP. HTTP? OK. TCP IP. Yeah. There's a virtualized network in between. Yeah. <clears throat> Layers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this virtualized network isn't just the Linux network stack. It's Docker's drivers on top as well. So you're executing a lot more code for traffic to get from Apache to PHP FPM and back again. It's inevitable that it's not quite as fast. If, you're, if your site's not heavily loaded, if you're not doing performance critical stuff, you might not notice it. But if you're doing anything performance related, you are losing performance there. And that will translate directly if you're, especially if you're running in the cloud, you'll have to spin up more containers in the cloud than you would otherwise. So my advice is you don't do that. And there's two rules of thumb that I use and I teach teams when I'm coaching them on dockerizing things. If you'd always put them on the same physical server, you'd never ever split them up under any circumstances. Always put them in one container. Co-locate them together. Like Apache and PHP FPM or Nginx and PHP FPM, you'd never run those on two different physical servers. You'd never have Apache on one and then just PHP FPM on the other. You'd never ever do that. So co-locate them, put them in the same container. If you'd put them on different servers to scale, for example, with databases, for example, as you scale, you'll move MySQL off your box onto a back-end box and you'll just have a, a tier of web servers and PHP in front. Put those in different containers from day one. Those, that's, how you, that's the guidance for separating stuff out. And that will help you enormously for avoiding problems down the road. And the other thing about this image we're talking about here, this generic PHP image, is that's actually what I run in dev. And I sideload my app, I sideload any specific config for my app using those mount points I showed you earlier. Um, because I can use this image for pretty much any app I work on and write. So that's layer three, image three. We're almost there. Is it okay so far? Cool. Now, not all of us write and ship complete apps from scratch. Some of us are writing add-ons for an existing app, like WordPress or Magento. We're writing plugins for them and shipping those. And so, especially if you've got a, a team of two or three people, remote workers, for example, it can be handy to have an image with that vanilla app baked in, a WordPress image that developers start from, rather than them having to unpack everything on their own operating system to start with, on their own computer. And if you do that, try and make it as vanilla as possible. With the caveat that if, you, if there's plugins you're using all the time, if you'd like you've got a favorite caching plugin that you use, it's your go-to caching plugin, you might as well stick that in straight away so the developers are used to having that around. Okay. Um, it saves having to maintain it in lots of other images higher up the stack. So any common plugins, put them in there. 
and then you can use this as the basis for any other customizations you want down the road. So a lot of these images we're creating are creating capabilities and not the finished article in their own right. They allow us to run something that where in dev we can tailor it by hand and then when we want to ship it, that's when we build this final image. So the final image is where you bake your app in and all its config. And if things are going well, you make a profit. It's the old joke, isn't it? For me, this is, this is the final layer of any, any image stack that I build, is baking my app in. Okay? And at this point, I'm just, all the code that's side-loaded via slash workspace and slash config, I just copy those files into the image. That's how I bake them in. It's literally copy wherever the host is, slash workspace into slash config. That's it. And then they're no longer mounted when the image runs in dev and prod. You don't want to sideload, you don't want to mount anything at those points. You just need to mount your logs and your persistent data. So you cut down your mount points as well. That's your final layer. And that gives you a stack of up to five images. So you'll see that, you'll see images for all of these four on GitHub from me. Obviously, this is what I'm shipping to my customers. It's not on GitHub, like you can see, for obvious reasons. Um, but that's how I do it. And I found this approach works very well. Um, current clients I'm doing this with, I've been with them for 18 months. And in those times, we're about to ship version three of their application. Not once have we had to change this approach with this. I'm confident that it stands the test of time. It does mean you've got more than one Docker file to maintain, I'll be honest. Um, and I know that's not for everybody. But if you, I'm not a big fan of big monolithic uh, Docker files because if, one, you know, if I'm shipping something to a different customer, all of a sudden I've got the same thing in two different Docker files. And I've got to remember to edit it in two places if I'm doing something like for a security release or something. So it's much easier to have a layer that you edit once and then when you build it all via CI, via Jenkins or something, it will just take care of all that for you. So that works for my approach. It reduces my cognitive load. I know if it's something PHP related, I go to the PHP image. And then I just tell Jenkins to rebuild all my images. And if it's to do with Ubuntu, I, I go down there and then they all have to rebuild and they all have to be downloaded, which takes forever. But that can't be helped. <laughs> Nature of the beast. What do you think? Sound all right? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm curious about this one process, one container. Okay. As I said, I heard that doctor. Yes. But I've never tried containerized PHP application. But if I did, yeah. without hearing your advice, I would probably do like FDM and NGX or whatever. Yeah. Same thing. So uh, do you think that advice was given sort of naively in the early days, forgetting that things like FDM exist? Or is that still a genuinely held belief? I can only say what I've seen. I've not talked to these people. I don't know their thought processes behind it. I can only see what they've written and what they've published. I went on Docker Hub today to grab the screenshots to put into the slides, and I noticed um, PHP is one of those top five images appearing on the top of Docker Hub once you start exploring. And I noticed it has no web server in there. It's just PHP FPM. So it looks like they are still doing that today. But it, that, that could be there with the intention that you had a web server that was good like. I don't believe people do in practice. Even if, even if it's their intention, because Docker presents those as official images, that's what they call them, mm -hmm. even though they're maintained by Docker and not by P, the PHP team, um, it confuses people mm -hmm. in reality. I. One of the reasons I've mentioned that in this talk is I've seen a team go onto Docker Hub, see, oh, there's an official PHP image. Efficient. They thought that meant it was done by the PHP team. Mm. So they downloaded it and followed that approach of separate containers because they thought that was what they were being told to do by the PHP.net team. That's what they thought. So it creates confusion. Why Docker still does this, I don't know. I do follow the Docker CTO. We have talked on Twitter twice, maybe. Um, he doesn't really know me. I don't really know him. I uh, wouldn't even say we're acquaintances. So I don't know what their thought processes are. As someone who's built servers and servers that have done heavy lifting, um, I would never do it. 
It does sound incredible when you think about it. I've seen voices in the PHP community also do this, and their argument is you can easily change from one PHP uh, version to the next with this. But to do that, either Apache's got to be reconfigured, which means you've got to log in and edit the files, or you've got to start another container anyway, so you don't actually get any benefit in practice. Mm. Um, you could have different virtual hosts for each um, PHP version, so Apache just routes it via that. But in practice, you're not going to have those application routes, those URLs. They're not going to work in, on your production server. And with my experience, I want the same URLs in dev as I'm going to have in test and live. I don't want any differences, even convenience differences. For me, I don't want that behavior. Um, I, don't, I believe in alignment is the phrase I would use there. So you can do it. People do it. I don't know. Please. Forever, but does, does the, the individual PHP image start the PHP executable when you boot it? You, I would have to have a look at it to be certain. I believe it does, but you'd have to look at it to be certain. I, I just wonder if this, that's done with a different use case in mind. I don't use it. I don't use it. But talking to the people who were using it, which is what triggered this part of the talk for me, mm. I think it must. Sure. Because otherwise, I don't know how they would be, I don't know why they'd be using it. So I, I'm expecting that it would, but because I don't use it, I'm not 100% certain. So that would be? PHP FPM on a port. Oh, so it's, like, it's not the, the CLI? I believe, it runs, I believe it runs PHP FPM on a port. It certainly installs yeah. PHP FPM. Yeah, You'd have to have a look to see if it actually starts PHP FPM or not. Mm, okay. But well, I've seen people use it for <laughs> serving websites. And I, knowing that team, I suspect it actually just start PHP FPM for you. Right. Um, but I, yeah, so for me personally, I'd never do it that way. Any more questions about the layers? From anyone? So no? If you run like, um, something like Memcache. I would run it in its own container. In fact, I do run it in its own container. Right, OK. And so you'd have another um, doc file that would have yes. that setup. Um, I actually use the Docker provided memcache container. Right. Because I don't need to change its behavior or its config at all. So I just download that and run that. And then in production, I will use something like AWS's Elastic Cache. So there won't be a Docker container for memcache in production. They'll be using uh, AWS's Elastic Cache, for example. So that's another reason why you wouldn't bake it into the same container as your app. Yeah. Um, the only excuse, excuse is the wrong word. The only reason I could think of for baking everything into a huge image um, was if you're sending the image out to a customer and, it was the, and the customer couldn't cope with you sending three or six images. Um, I still don't like that idea, but I can see how some people might think that's the right way to go. I guess if, if you're if you're an actual company, yeah, that's you like, yeah, and you're like a, you know, like a one trick pony, you've only you've got like a massive monolith, and that's all you've ever got. Yeah, then you probably don't get the benefit of having multiple documents. Correct. You know, if you're, if you're, Correct. You get the benefit here if you're yeah. building stuff for other people, or if you're like everything you build is in like microservices. So you're spinning up lots of new little apps. I guess you get you get much more benefit by splitting it out so you can get the reusability. All I can say is personally, I find even those companies end up running a second website for something. It might be their status website, it might be an internal website with some internal tools in. Um, I personally have never worked with a company that only ever had one website full stop. They always end up tacking something else on, even if it's down the road, in my personal experience. That's all I can say. Um, I absolutely agree with you. If you've only got one monolith, then that's all you ship and all you do, um, then fair enough. Yeah, you might want to just you know, bake it all in like that. Um, Most of the time. Speak yeah. Even companies I've worked with that had a monolith-like application, at some point down the road, they attempted a rewrite. Um, or they'd be doing a new version of a framework, 
and that can often be as big as a rewrite. And at that point, again, having things split up would have made life easier for them if we'd had Docker back in those days. And it gives you flexibility for the future. And so with all these Docker files yeah. and, and the layers and you've got your image, um, you might have said this earlier, but it's okay. the, is that image the same as, um, is that dev image and test and pod image, but customized by um, environment variable types? Not quite. So this generic PHP image, is that's what I use as my dev image. And via those volume mount points, I inject my app and I inject um, any config for those startup scripts to pick up when they run to set up Nginx, et cetera, for me. So that they're not baked into the image at this point. So I can use this for pretty much anything I do. And that's what I run in dev. And then I'll either, you know, if I'm doing something with WordPress, I'll ship a WordPress one or I'll bake my app in instead if I'm shipping a bespoke app. And I'll bake those in when I ship those to test and live. But um, and sometimes if I'm not, yeah, if the app splits up into like microservices or into two or three big monoliths, and I'm, and I'm only working on one section, I might use the production image in dev for those other sections because I'm never going to edit that code. So why not use what's in prod at that time? Because what I'm working on has got to be compatible with it. So then, um you'd have a set of Docker files like that yeah. for dev, and you'd have a set of Docker files the same except for PHP. Not quite, no. Files. Sorry, these, these are the same in, these, so there's only, if you look on my uh, GitHub, um, you'll see that there's only one set of Docker files. They're all my dev Docker files. This one is the only one that goes out the door to live. And so this Docker file you can't see because it's unique to my customers and their apps. But it, it, it will start from one of these. That from statement at the top will mention normally that one, the PHP app. And then it will just load in like, the production opcache config and things like that. I don't have a separate, these, are, these I don't have separate of these for live. Okay. Any more questions about the layers? This has generated some really good debate. Does anyone think this is complete and utter horse crap? And it's okay. I can't, if you all agree with me all the time, I can't learn. Something uh, came to mind. Um, I was saying briefly, um, sort of in this area before, but yeah. uh, didn't it derive from Puppet and Chef? Oh, what did you derive? But were those quite common? And then Docker came along and. They're still. They're still very common. They're still very common. Um, I haven't got any slides on this, but it's a very good point. Because I've seen teams that have invested a lot in Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt or any of those. Because um, those, when people talk about orchestration, that's, they originally used to talk about those deployment tools. These days they're talking about Kubernetes, which is a completely different kettle of fish. But they used to talk about what were actually configuration tools that would um, deploy code onto a server and configure it the right way and you could point at the pool of 500 servers and it would make them all identical. Um, and I've seen people take that investment, um, and I use the word investment because they spent so much money building this capability, and then try to run them inside Docker containers to make the Docker containers do the right thing. And they ended up in such... They found it so hard to maintain and keep on top of it. You're much better off with a 20-line Docker file. You'll see on GitHub, these Docker files are tiny. If you take my comments out, I'd love comments, I'm sorry. I comment everything, everywhere, all the time. Um, you take those comments out, and some of those have probably only got five or 10 executable statements in them. It's so much easier to maintain. And at that point, Doc, uh, sorry, Chef and Puppet, etc., aren't adding any value for building images. So I don't use them at all. You can still use them for deployment, but I believe, I haven't used Kubernetes in Angular. I'm going to be doing that this year. I believe Kubernetes has its own deployment tools and its own ecosystem of tooling that you would use instead. I don't know if that's answered your question. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Um, they're different approaches and they're different kind of parts. Mm. Um, have you heard of Scale Summit? If you have any interest in running servers and DevOps, 
Scale Summit. Um, it's, I believe it's somewhere between March and May this year in London. It's um, low price and it's a meeting of everybody who does this kind of thing. Go along. It's, it's, a, it's an unconference type format where people suggest uh, there's room set aside. People say, I want to talk about this. And people pile in if they like it. If they don't like it, they go somewhere else. Um, it's excellent. It gets hundreds of people. Um, go to scale summits where you'll see people doing this. I was there last year, the only developer in the room. I've done servers and DevOps. I've, I've done everything from CTO downwards. So um, as long as I'm not doing front end design, which I'm utterly rubbish at, I'm OK at stuff. I was the only developer in the room. And one of the, so most of the time, I was just listening to what people were doing because um, it was all sysadmins. Um, or DevOps, as they call themselves these days. And most people who were running containers were running mixed estates. Some things they'd move to containers, and other things they'd not managed to move yet for whatever reason, normally like a manpower. So, it's, so they were still having this problem of some, some stuff was still using Chef and Puppet, and some stuff they were trying to use Chef and Puppet with, some people moved on to just pure Docker files. It was interesting to hear all this experience in the room. And so if you've got any interest in this sort of thing, go to Scale Summit this year. I can't recommend it enough as a learning experience. Please. I'm sort of curious about your um, <laughs> the, like placeholder substitutions yep. in your init. Yep. Kind of makes me raise my eyebrows slightly. OK. It sounds a bit weird, but I imagine you've arrived at that for a very good reason. Yes. Because I would have thought, like, off the top of my head, I think one of the things you were, you were substituting in was, was document routes. Yes. And Tell you what, right, so this is slide, how are we for time? We've got a, we've got a few more slides, but I'll quickly skip back and we'll pull it up again. How are we for time? Um, it's four, four past nine. Room-wise, yeah. stuff, we were, we're fine, it's just we not getting in space. Then it's charged. Oh, let's, let's jump back. I mean, that's the whole point of these type of talks for me, is to de have these kind of discussions. Right. Mm. So this is what you're talking about. So the first thing is the root. So we just, just quick, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Are you doing that with like uh, sed or something? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Exactly that. I'm using it, I'm doing sed on it. Um, this script here, that's on GitHub. You can go and read it and see exactly what it does. Mm. But it's done, it's done using sed. Um, the reason I've got to move the root around is Older apps like WordPress expect to be installed in the root of the web server. No. So they, ex they expect that when you go to slash uh, on a website, so no, no query path whatsoever, you've just got the host name, they expect the web server to look for index.php in the root folder. That's what they expect to do. So, so you've got a, um, but modern applications, expect to be installed outside of the web root, and they just have a public folder with an index.php file in that then loads all the other code in a safe manner. Um, I don't want to get into a debate about which approach people should use. I don't think it's helpful at the end of the day. Clearly, both work. Uh, you know, WordPress powers, what, 20 odd percent of the internet? So clearly, both approaches work. But there isn't, you know, this is one of the things about the PHP world. If you go to the Rails community, to a large extent, the Python community, those are monocultures to a large extent compared to the PHP world. The PHP world doesn't even have one PHP community. We've got a Laravel community, we've got Symfony community, we've got WordPress community, Magento communities. We have, um, we are a plural ecosystem because PHP is so flexible, it doesn't impose any of these things on you. PHP itself is not very opinionated. It's kind of nudging a bit more, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, we have to reflect that if when we're dockerizing and containerizing applications. So I suppose that is a mechanism that allows you to keep a more standard uh, parent image. Well, this is in the parent image, yes. So this is in the parent image. So you can then modify that and make sure. Yes. So my generic image, this would point to the slash public folder of a bespoke app. This would point to a file. I have a dummy file I install that has nothing in there. Um, Nginx will quite happily load an empty config file, but I can't see it's 
I don't want to remove that line because telling said to remove line 26 what happens when line 26 moves because I've changed something else in here yeah it's easier to tell it to load a dummy file with nothing in and this loads my PHP FPM communication com uh, config but for WordPress this has to load all the URL rewriting needed for permalinks yeah so it has to load a different config so could you not do that with a clean that includes the standardized I could. But if I've got those files open, <laughs> right, so think of your text editor or your IDE of choice, your text editor or your IDE of choice, chances are it's got a row of tabs somewhere on the screen to show you which files you've got open. If that file has got the same name, how do you tell which one, which tab is which when you've got them both open at once? That's why I do that. In my world, that's my wordpress.conf file. And, when, and that tab says wordpress.conf, so I know which one it is. And for my apps, that would be dummy.conf, for example, my empty one. So I, that helps me be more productive as a developer. I wish... Can't WordPress do this, the following thread? Of course. Do I think, yeah. Can, can, you, can um, NGX not do um, wildcard includes? It probably can, so you could you could say have a folder and drop them in there. You could do that. I don't know why I take against we like to copy with set quite so strongly, but it just that's coming back. No. I so don't trouble me for reasons I can't really explain. It's okay, James. You don't have to do that. There's flexibility in it. If something feels wrong, it normally is. Yeah. It's good to trust your instincts. I do not know whether you can do wildcard includes inside a server statement, because I've never tried it. Do you know what I'm going to be doing when I'm back in the hotel? <laughs> Actually, I'm not, because this isn't my dev laptop. This is just my presentation laptop. My dev laptop's at home. But when I get back home, I'm going to try that and see if we can do wildcards there, because that would be even better. Because then I'm not rewriting those. I've just got to rewrite that. So the rewriting clearly bothers you to some extent. Um, <laughs> if there's a better way. <laughs> if there's a better way, I would be foolish not to change I don't it. Know why. Yeah, I don't know why. I've been using Unix systems since 92. So back in the days of X25 and pad terminals before we had TCP IP. So things like said to me are just the first thing I reach for. Mm. So to have someone like yourself come along and say, why are you using said? Do you have to? Is awesome. Because you're challenging 25, quarter of a century of ingrained behavior, <laughs> which is so healthy. Yeah, that's healthy. That's good. I will go and find out because if you know you're absolutely right that would be better now the next question is if you could do wildcards how would you guarantee loading order <laughs> we would need to test it and see if nginx honors that it may not um, and order, I don't know if order matters for these statements, it might. Mm, I don't know. The other reason I would say that this is a nice approach is because I've given these things names, I've given them labels, it's helping to guide people what those config files should do mm. as well. So that can be helpful for some people. If you give them a blank canvas, they're no good. But if you give them something like Laravel or Ruby on Rails, they've become a highly productive developer because you've taken away the blank canvas. It can really help a lot of people. Um, that's not going to be as popular as Arabel, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. We're going to find out. Where were we? So. So that's five layers. Can you think of any more we might want? Just because I've got five doesn't mean five is the definitive thing, does it? You mean on top of On top of those. You might have different flavors, is that? Different flavors, yeah. If you're shipping containers, sorry, if you're shipping images to your customers, for them to run on their infrastructure, you might be tailoring things again. Yeah, flavors approach. 
for them. So you might do that. You might stick that on top. So you might have an app, um, but it might need something specific for them that can't just be set up at um, runtime. Yeah. For example, your app may be modular, and they you know they buy plugins from a, uh, but they haven't bought all the plugins. So you just give them the ones they've paid for, and it's a distribution mechanism. We can take advantage of the fact that Docker images can be a distribution mechanism. I think we've already covered what do you think. <laughs> Does anyone have any more thoughts before we get into a couple of common questions to wrap up? I have actually one more question on the layers. Okay, awesome. So, so basically, okay, uh, so imagine you build up your application and you deploy it to the test environment. You yeah. fully test it, it all works. Right? Yes. And then in the meantime, you update one of the lower layers. So yeah. WordPress gets updated. Yes. And, and then you want to deploy it to the production. Yeah. Will it break? If, if say, the new WordPress breaks in any way or... It... Or can you say it absolutely kind of like requires only a certain version of Layer or like I had a section on that that I took out for time, thinking it wouldn't be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I had 20 slides on that <laughs> to do with how Docker names things. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I, when I was doing my rehearsals, I thought, it's not relevant to building, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so thank you. No, no, this is good. Um, I'm going to try and do this with one slide now. Let me... Let me find something that's got a label on it. We have got one. Bear with me. Because I now have seen it, because I remember doing the screenshot for it earlier. Sorry. We'll get there. We will get there. Here we go. Here we go. OK. I don't know if you can see clearly there. Um, but there's a colon in the middle of the, um, of the name. Everything before the colon is the image name, and everything afterwards is called a tag. And all a tag is is a piece of text. Docker doesn't understand that piece of text. It has no meaning to Docker whatsoever. Um, so Docker doesn't know about version numbers and semantic versioning. It just treats it as text. But we can choose to use that as a version number. So in our production environments, we can say run image version, you know, image name, colon, and whatever version we want. Um, and it doesn't matter if there's a newer image coming through the pipeline, as you talked about with the new WordPress thing. It doesn't matter at that point. That image will reach production when it's been through your, whatever your test and release cycle is. Now, there's some conventions around this. I wish I had this slide. <laughs> I'm sorry that I don't have them. Um, you may, if you've, if you've used Docker or seen Docker stuff, you may have seen sometimes after the colon, it says latest. I don't know if any of you have seen that. That's like tracking master on GitHub. It's a convention that people use to say, this is what my latest image is. And you can put that in your runtime environment to say, always download the latest thing. As with master, if you're tracking something that's changing randomly without any proper process control, you're going to have a disaster, but it's there if you need it. But the other thing people do, um, normally version numbers have an X, Y, and a Z component. Um, so people will, will sometimes use a second tag with just the X and Y version on as well. Um, I had a slide showing Neo4j, the graph database I'm talking about next week. Um, and their latest image has three tags on it. It's got the colon latest. It's got colon 3.3.3, because that's the current version. And then they have another tag that just says Neo4j colon 3.3. And what you can do with that is put that in your runtime environment so that any bug fixes for version 3.3 get picked up automatically. But 3.3 to 3.4 with Neo4j may require some manual intervention. It may break some backwards compatibility. They do that from time to time. So you wouldn't track latest. So you can do it that way. A bit like um, Node has like a tilde saying you can, um, yes. A bit like that. Minor, but don't do yes. <laughs> a bit like that, yeah. A bit like the tilde. Mm -hmm. Except Docker has no understanding of that. We have to do it manually. We have, 
Um, and it all comes down, I mean, the, the image property I was going to talk about there was immutability. That was the section of slides I deleted. And the idea is, is Docker images aren't immutable. You can replace an image at any time you want and nobody will know. They do have a different hash underneath, but I can't remember the last time I looked at an image's hash. If I ask people I work with, I bet you they can't tell me the last time they looked either. No one does. They look at the names and they look at the labels. Sorry, I keep calling them labels because um, they're, they're, technically they're called tags, but they're just a text label. That's why I call them labels. Um, but we as developers and as sysadmins can, and DevOps people can choose to say, once we've published this image with this tag, we're never going to overwrite it. We're going to change the tag, bump it from 3.3.3 to 3.3.4. And we can also publish it with the 3.3 tag as well. So you've got the best of both worlds. All right. So these slides are already online, but I'm now going to see if I can rewind because Keynote can saves versions of the presentation. I'm going to see if I can get my immutability slides out and put them back in and I'll re-upload it. Let's see if I can get those for you because it came up. Ah, no more deleting slides for presentations. Cool, cool. that's awesome. That. Right. Oh, there's three common questions I want to tackle. Um, they're not directly related to containers and images and their properties, but they do come up when people containerize applications. So I want to make sure they're covered. There we go.